Biological information, loss of function, mutations. We've been talking about the book Biological Information, New Perspectives, edited by a number of uh, people in enthousi enthusiastic about intelligent design, and uh, Bruce Gordon, who is actually more of a, uh, apparently a uh, a fan of self-organization theory, all of which do not believe that uh, you know, Darwinism is currently uh, proposed has an <coughs> adequate explanation for life on Earth. Uh, it was published by World Scientific Publishing Company in 19, uh, pardon me, in 2013. Uh, proceedings of a uh, symposium held in 2011, and it was supposed to be published right away, but Springer after some outcry from Darwinists uh, backed off on it. Um, it is available on the web, uh, and you can actually look at the uh, chapters for free. Uh, it is also available as a book, and uh, that sells for something over $100. Uh, partly, I think they figured they were not going to sell too many copies. And they have to make up their investment some way. Um, the uh, book consists of a general introduction of a introduction to information theory and biology in several chapters, biological information and genetic theory, several chapters, theoretical molecular biology, several chapters, and then finally biological information and self-organizational complexity theory, which is uh, not intelligent design, so it's not strictly an intelligent design book. We're in the theoretical molecular biology section, and uh, our chapter today is getting there first, an evolutionary rate advantage for adaptive loss of function mutations. And it's written by Michael Behe, whom many of you know, uh, at Lehigh University. Um, the abstract starts out, over the course of evolution, organisms have adapted to their environments by mutating to gain new function or lose pre-existing ones. Because adaptation can occur by either of these modes, it is of basic interest to assess under what, if any, evolutionary circumstances one of them may predominate, loss of function or gain of function. Since mutation occurs at the molecular level, one must look there to discern if an adaptation involves gain or loss of function. Here I present a simple deterministic model for the occurrence and spread of adaptive gain of function versus loss of function mutations and compare the results to laboratory evolution experiments and studies of evolution in nature. The results demonstrate that loss of function mutations generally have an intrinsic evolutionary rate advantage over gain of function mutations, but that the advantage depends radically upon population size, ratio of selection coefficients of competing adaptive mutations, and ratio of the mutation rates to the adaptive states. Introduction. In On the Origin of Species, Charles Darwin emphasized that natural selection is relentless, continuously monitoring each organism for its fitness, selecting those with an advantage and weeding out the disadvantaged. Um, as we've seen from some of our other chapters, um, it's not quite as good as it's cracked up to be, but that's a different issue now. However, as Darwin also knew, an organism's advantage in a particular set of circumstances did not have to involve the gain of a new ability, such as the power to fly or swim. Indeed, it could loss, uh, involve the loss of those abilities. Flightless birds had adapted to their habitats partially by abandoning such a faculty. Some organisms went even further. Darwin described some barnacles in which the male was reduced to a transparent sac with little but a reproductive system remaining. By specializing in this way, the barnacles and their descendants presumably gained an adaptive advantage over competitors. 
In the 19th century, Darwin and his contemporaries could identify mutations only through their phenotypic effects. However, with the progress of biology, especially in the last half century, contemporary science can now characterize mutations also by their molecular effects to the genetic material of a species. In order to understand the roles of loss of function, or as he'll abbreviate it from here on, uh, LOF functions versus gain of function, or GOF mutations, one must keep phenotypic versus molecular changes separate. An altered visually observable phenotype may be due to any number, any of a number of disparate underlying molecular mutations. And he'll give an example. A mutant mouse that is 50% larger than its litter mates seems like an advantage, right? And probably in most circumstances is. Um, might have had the gene for a repressor protein that switches off production of growth hormone deleted. At the molecular level, that would be a loss of function mutation, since a functional molecular feature was deleted, even though the increased size of the mouse may strike the casual observer as a gain of function. On the other hand, a large mutant mouse might be due to the formation of a new promoter site for a transcription factor near a, green, a, a gene involved in growth, which would be a gain-of-function mutation, since a new functional molecular feature, the promoter site, was produced. In this paper, I will consider loss of function and gain-of-function mutations as affecting functional molecular features, such as genes and regulatory elements, no matter what their possible phenotypic effects may be. The model. Consider a population of organisms that comes under a new selective pressure. To respond to the pressure, two different, two different adaptive mutations are postulated to be potentially available. One which represents in the gain of a molecular function and another which results in the loss of one. What factors might affect the probabilities of either kind of mutation becoming fixed in the population in competition with the other? One factor of immediate importance is the rate of appearance of the adaptive mutations. It is very possible, very often possible, to eliminate a molecular function by a variety of mutations. Gain of function mutations, on the other hand, are generally much more specific, sometimes being produced in only one way. As an illustration, consider several mutations to human genes that give a measure of resistance to malaria. The best known such mutation is a sickle cell gene in which, by means of a single adenine to thymine transversion, what well, used to be adenine became thymine, and by the way, vice versa. The codon for a glutamic uh, residue in the sixth position of the beta chain, globin gene, is converted to a codon for valine. This can be considered a gain of function mutation because the hemoglobin gains a self association site on its surface, allowing the individual proteins upon deoxygenation to aggregate into microtubular like structures. Now, of course, it has its own problems, but uh, right now we're considering simply its advantage in the, in the situation where malaria is a common parasite. By an as yet unknown mechanism, the polymerization negatively affects the growth of malarial parasite, which spends part of its life cycle in the red blood cell. Now, another mutation which confers a measure of resistance to malaria is deficiency of glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, or G6PD as it's commonly known, which, in which a mutant gene produces little or no functional enzyme. For reasons that are unclear, this interferes with parasite viability, as other problems too. But, um, but the parasites apparently need G6PD for whatever reason. Population genetic studies have shown that hundreds of separate mutations have led to deficiency of wild-type G6PD in populations at risk for malaria. Hundreds of separate, different mutations. On the other hand, the mutation producing the sickle cell gene is thought to have arisen de novo only a few times in the last 10,000 years, or perhaps only once. The reason for the disparity in the number of de novo mutations is straightforward. To secure a sickle cell mutation, a particular nucleotide of the beta globin gene must be substituted in a particular way, I might add. Since the nucleotide mutation rate in humans is the order of 10 to the minus 8 substitutions per generation, and the transversion of that kind is only one third of that, or more or less, that is also the de novo rate of appearance of the sickle gene. 
On the other hand, there are many ways to produce a non-functional protein such as malaria-resistant G6PD. For example, during replication, the insertion of a nucleotide anywhere within the coding sequence results in a frame shift and likely in an active polypeptide. Deletion of a nucleotide in the coding region will have the same effect, as will alteration of a codon from sense to nonsense. Longer editing problem there, obviously, affect instead of effect. Uh, longer insertions and deletions will frequently have the same effect. Missense mutations, although not likely not completely inactivating the protein, will often make the protein less stable or less functional. And in case you're wondering, are the sense to nonsense, that's actually sense to the stop codon. Um, missense may not completely destroy, and depending on some of them, may not change it much at all. Thus, considered as a class, the mutation rate for a functional to a non-functional gene may be several orders of magnitude greater than the basic nucleotide mutation rate. Indeed, the adaptation rate of E. coli, whose generational nucleotide mutation is 50-fold lower than that of humans, has re recently been measured as 10 to the minus fifth. For the two, the two classes of mutations, in this paper I explore the effect of this factor on the evolutionary rate of spread of adaptive mutations as a function of population size, mutation size, mutation rate, selection coefficient, ratio of selection coefficients of the competing adaptive mutations, and the ratio of mutation rates to the adaptive state. Calculations were performed using a particular computer program just for completeness sake. The results in relatively small population sizes, this is where the effective uh, uh, number of uh, uh, the size of the genome is much less than one over the mutation rate. Unless otherwise stated, organisms are assumed to be haploid because most laboratory evolution experiments have been done with haploids. That would be bacteria. Uh, and the model is developed accordingly. The resulting equations can be applied to diploid organisms by replacing uh, N sub E by 2 N sub E. In order for an adaptive mutation to become fixed with a, in a population of relatively small size, two separate processes must occur, each with its own time scale. Number one, if the mutation does not yet exist in the population when the selective pressure begins, then the expected waiting time to the appearance of the selected mutation is uh, the waiting time for uh, mutation one is one over two times the number uh, of genomes in the population times the mutation rate times the selection rate, where s is the selection coefficient. Uh, once the selected mutation appears, the time for it to fix in the population, the fixation time, is equal to 2 times the natural logarithm of the effective population rate divided by s. Now, uh, notice that there's a reference for that. This is not just something he's pulling out of his hair, he of his head. If, um, if one is comparing two distinct mutations in the same population that are responsive to the same selective pressure, however, the, both the rates of mutation to the adaptive state and the selective coefficients may differ. And so you'll have a TW2 and a TFX2 uh, as well as the TW1 and TFX1 that we saw before, defined in roughly the same way only for the second mutation. Thus, whenever um, RD over FX is greater than 1, the loss of function mutation is expected to fix in the population before the selective gain of function mutation appears. So you no longer need it. Figure 1 illustrates this situation. Two curves are plotted for the appearance and subsequent spread of a loss of function and a gain of function mutation in a population of one million organisms. Now, you are probably asking, what in the world is RD over FX? Well, there you are. Um, it's not quite that complicated. As you can see, the area in red 
um, the, the insight here is simply uh, derivation, which is der derived from before. I've omitted a lot of the math, and you get um, uh, 1 over 4, the effective number, times the logarithm of the effective number, uh, and then Rs and Rv. Um, and this is what happens normally is the loss of function curve comes up much before the gain of function curve simply because there are hundreds or thousands of ways for there to be a loss of function before the gain. Notice that the loss of function is, is shown here as not as rapidly fixed as the gain of function, but because it starts earlier, it doesn't really matter. Now, figure two plots the value of rd over fx, which is the really important number, versus the effective population size for several values of rv. That's the, the ratio of how likely you are to get a variant for a loss of function versus a variant uh, for a gain of function. And um, as can be seen, which we'll see in just a minute, the, that ratio is largely insensitive to changes in RV. The ratio of the mutation rates to the adaptive state, decreasing RV 100-fold from 1,000 to 10, leaves the value of RD over Fx little changed. In all of these circumstances, except where RV equals 2, at effective population sizes near 10 to the 7th, which is uh, 10 million. Uh, the ratio of the time for the loss of function mutation to spread to the difference in the expected waiting time to the ex selected gain of function versus loss of function mutations is well above one, which means that most of the time, 90-98% uh, of the time, maybe 99.9% .9 of the time in certain circumstances, you're going to get loss of functions instead of gain of functions. And there you can see with these numbers in yellow are ones that I put up there, uh, allowing the, the selection ratio to be roughly the same. Um, uh, 1,000 and 10 are almost identical. It's not until you get to 2 that you start getting some separation, um, which means that in this particular case, there would be only twice as many ways to get a loss of function as a gain of function. And even so, you don't get down to a ratio of 1, which is when you start getting as many gain of functions as you do loss of functions, until you're out to a million organisms. You can see it really makes a very little difference most of the time until you get uh, until you get to uh, where they're almost as easy to gain a function as to lose one. Figure 3 examines the relationship between um, the, um, our final answer, our sub d over fx, versus the effective population size for several values of rs with rv held constant at 1,000, which is about usually gain of, pardon me, a loss of function is something of the order of a thousand times as easy to get as a gain of function. Um, in this case, our, D, our sub d over fx depends linearly of, on the ratio of the selection coefficients. At any population size in the range, a decrease in a factor of 10 in a rs decreases r sub d over fx by approximately the same factor. The magnitude of s, the, co the selection coefficient itself, which is absent from equation 2, does not affect the results. Thus, when r sub s is about 0 0.01, that is, when the selection coefficient for the loss of function mutation is only 1% of that of the gain of function mutation, Rd over fx decreases to value of 1 at a population size of about um, uh, 150,000 versus a population size of about um, 15 million 
uh, when RS is 1. And I'm skipping over a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, here, the RV is, is held constant at 1,000. And in RS, you see 1, 0 0.1, 0 0.01. You can see how it... Uh, um, how the ratio of the selection cons, uh, cons does make a difference. If you don't select very fast, then then you don't fix fast enough in the population to be able to take over before the gain of function comes across. Relatively large population sizes. In this section, I consider the relatively large population size where um, where the uh, one over the uh, variation is actually larger than any. Uh, pardon me. Any is is approximately larger or than equal to. Yeah, any is larger than one over the variation si uh, uh, size. As population size increases, the expected waiting time to the appearance of either or both selected mutations can shrink to much less than the expected time for the mutations to spread in the population. In fact, one or both mutations may be present continuously in the population at a lower percent, low percentage as a neutral or detrimental allele before the new selection pressure makes it adaptive. Thus, in this population size, a, range, a, a different metric is reply, required to follow the relative advantages of loss of function versus gain of function mutations. And the, the different method is called R of Fx, and uh, as you can see, there's... Uh, a little bit of math involved. And I'm just going to skip over uh, most of the other stuff for now. Um, uh, discussion, and this is where the paper gets particularly interesting, um, loss of function versus gain of function adaptive mutations. Organisms can adapt to their environment either by requiring new abilities or abandoning old ones. This can be observed in such examples as legless snakes and sightless cave fish and of course flatless birds. Science has learned, especially in the last 50 years, that altered observable phenotypes are, are the manifestation of changes to the genetic endowment of an organism. It is also, well, except for epigenetic changes which we've discussed elsewhere. Uh, it has also been learned that there is not a necessary correlation between loss or gain of fundability at the phenotypic level and loss or gain of a functional genetic element at the molecular level. In other words, what strikes an observer as a phenotypic gain of function may be caused by either a molecular loss or gain of function. The same holds for a phenotypic loss of function. It may be the result of a genetic gain or loss of function. Because organisms can adapt by either molecular gain of function mutations or loss of, fun loss of function mutations, it is of basic interest to determine which, if either, kind of mutation will dominate under various circumstances. Research over the past 50 years has shown that many genetic elements consist of multiple nucleotides. Protein coding regions can be thought of as, as thousands of nucleotides in length. RNA genes can be hundreds of nucleotides. Regulatory elements and processing signals can be several nucleotides to dozens of nucleotides long. A substantial portion of possible mutations in these elements will result in the diminution or loss of their function. Thus, as a class, Loss of function mutations for a particular genetic element will occur at a rate from several times to several orders of magnitude times the basic nucleotide substitution rate. That is not the case for gain of function mutations. Consider two examples. First, a transcription factor binding site that is two, 10 nucleotides in length, and a second, a DNA sequence which has 9 of 10 nucleotides that are necessary to form a second regulatory site. Suppose that in response to a new selective pressure, an adaptive effect could be secured by either mutating the first site so it has lost its function or by mutating the second mismatching residue of the second site so that it gained the function or perhaps gained it back. The loss of function mutation will on average appear at 10 times the nucleotide substitution rate simply because there are multiple ways of breaking the functional el functioning element. The gain of function mutation, however, would appear at even less than the basic rate of nucleotide substitution because for a currently non-functional potential genetic element, there, there it is possible that one of the correct nucleotides in the sequence will mutate before the incorrect one. 
And also that the incorrect one has to mutate to the precise correct one that it's supposed to rather than any one of the other two. He doesn't say that, but that's true. Second, consider a recently duplicated gene which could provide an adaptive effect in response to new selective pressure if a certain nucleotide in the gene were altered, allowing the duplicate gene product to, say, diverge productivity in activity from the parent gene product. So now instead of just metabolizing glucose, you can metabolize lactose as well or something like that. Suppose, however, that an adaptive effect could also be had by reducing or eliminating the activity of another separate gene. Because of the many ways in which a gene can be altered to lose function, the loss of function mutation would have a rate several orders of magnitude greater than that of the gain of function mutation for the duplicated gene. There can be cases in which a gain of function mutation may appear at several times the nucleotide substitution rate. I discussed earlier the sickle mutation, which a single particular nucleotide in the beta globin gene must be changed. Yet in other cases of gain of function, there can be several possible nucleotides to change, each of which will suffice. For example, Cunhago et al. replaced the essential gene for adenylate kinase in Geobacillus uh, steatothermophilus, a moderate thermophile. Basically, it's a bacterium that grows in hot temperatures, or not too hot, not the 198 that some bacteria do, but, but uh, you know, 120 or something like that. Um, with that of bac Bacillus subtilis, a mesophile, which may, they then grew in a turbidostat at increasing temperatures. Basically, they're growing it in something that we can control the temperature and we keep the germs just keep multiplying in the same broth that is con constantly fed and kept at the same bacterial concentration more or less. Over the course of 1500 generations they isolated six thermostable mutants of the enzyme. One single point mutation and five double point mutations derived from the single mutant. Thus, in these circumstances, the enzyme could gain the function of being active in a hostile environment by any of s altering any of six positions. Well, to be precise, it's altering one position and possibly another, any, any one of another five. So there are mo there's more than one pathway to make the, uh, uh, to mutate the new uh, enzyme to the desirable temperature a stability range. The, uh, nonetheless, the number of ways to break a functional element will almost always be much greater than the number of ways to construct one. So that in almost all cases, RV would be expected to be greater than one. Effective uh, disparity and adaptive rate. In this chapter, I investigate the effective disparity in the rate of mutation to an adaptive state for loss of function and gain of function mutations as a function of several parameters. The model presented here is a simple deterministic one, which does not consider the probabilistic nature, nature of changes in allele frequencies. So it's a limited model uh, in an important way, but it could be expanded relatively easily. Because of its simplicity, the general behavior of the investigated model is visible with considerable clarity, and the issue of evolutionary rate advantage of adaptive loss of function mutations is highlighted. If a loss of function mutation with a smaller selective selection coefficient is first fix fixed in a population, what scenario is most likely to occur after gain of function mutation eventually appears? The answer to that question is likely to depend on sharply on the specific gen genetic elements involved. One possible scenario is that gain of function mutation also spreads to fixation and the loss of function mutation remains fixed. The second possibility is that, depending on the physical nature of the mutation, the loss of mut function mutation may be repaired by subsequent mutation after the gain of function mutation spreads in the population. If it cannot be repaired, it may be replaced by horizontal gene transfer or by having its function taken over by another genetic element or the organism may adapt in other ways to its loss. And of course, if you're talking uh, diploid organisms, they can get uh, a normal uh, gene from another uh, mixed with, uh, with the gain of function gene. 
uh, which is kind of sort of horizontal gene transfer. Penman et al. recently demonstrated that the outcome in competition between the sickle mutation, which is highly protective against malaria, and various thalassemic disorders, which are less productive, is quite difficult to predict because of epistatic effects unrelated to their anti-malarial activities. You get both of them and uh, you're suddenly in a much greater trouble, or perhaps much less trouble. You have much less trouble with um, unwanted sickle crises um, because of a smaller red cell to begin with. Thus, the future course of the evolution of a system after initial fixation of a loss of function mutation might be considerably more complex than a linear succession of mutations with increasing selective value. For the uh, mutation rate of 10 to the minus 9 at population sizes uh, greater than 10 to the 8th, a loss of function mutation is no longer expected to fix in the population before a selectable gain of function mutation occurs because the gain of muta function mutation is already there in the population. Because, as he said, the larger population sizes produce both types of mutations within the time it would take for the loss of muta function mutation to spread in the population. Nonetheless, even though the metric RD over Fx decreases below 1 in this range, in many cases the loss of function mutation will become the dominant mutation in the population anyway. In order to assess the advantage of loss of function versus gain of function mutations in this population range, a new metric, R of Fx, was introduced, and we saw that equation, uh, which is the ratio of gain, loss of function to gain of function mutations when their fraction in the population first sums to 1. Figure 6 shows that uh, loss of function mutations always possesses a rate advantage over gain of function mutations if the respective selection coefficients are equal. That is, if Rs is equal to 1. Uh, thus, the loss of function mutant will compose from 59% uh, of the population to 97% of the population. If at this point, the mutants then drift neutrally in the population because it is postulated that neither has a select advantages over the other. The loss of function mutation is expected to become fixed with a probability equal to its population fraction. And skipping over a few other things, over the past 40 years, many laboratories have conducted evolution experiments, observing an adaptation of microorganisms to varying environmental conditions, and in many cases, identifying the molecular changes that comprise the adaptive mutation. How do the results obtained in this chapter bear on the interpretation of those experiments? In other words, what is the intersection of theory and practice? In comparison to uh, experiments where the uh, population is much less than one over the mutation rate. The most extensive laboratory evolution experiment to date has been performed under the direction of L Richard Lenski at Michigan State University. Starting in the early 1990s, Lenski and colleagues began growing 10 milliliter cultures of E. coli which undergo six to seven doublings per day. Each day, they transferred 1% of the culture to fresh medium. Over the years, the cultures have undergone more than 50,000 generations. All adaptive mutations identified to date appeared uh, to be a, a loss of function ones. By the way, to translate that into human uh, in perspective, that would be the equivalent of um, 500 to 1 million years. The single most beneficial mutation was the destruction of the RBS operon by insertion sequences. The most beneficial mutation was to destroy an operon. The value of the selective coefficient for this was approximately 0 0.02. Other identified loss of function mutations included ones in the PICF, NADR, PBPA, RODA, HOOKB, SOCKB, MALT, and TOPA genes. A whole bunch of destructive mutations. 
A number of other adaptation, adaptive genes have been identified to date, but the nature of the mutations, whether loss of function or gain of function, have not been reported. They haven't sequenced it yet, so we don't know exactly how it works. And skipping on down, Lenski's group recently reported a very adaptive citrate plus phenotype. And some of you, I'm sure, have heard of that. The bacteria can now metabolize citrate anaerobically. It could always metabolize citrate aerobically, by the way. And it always had the citric acid cycle in it. So this, uh, you know, it's, this apparently required both loss of function and gene duplication mutations. Nothing new was added, unless you want to count gene duplication, which is kind of, mm, well, new, but not any more new than as Eric's copy of something is new. Comparison to experiments where two selective routes were potentially available. An interesting conceptual blend of the Lenski and Cunago approaches was recently published by Gager et al., Sorry about that. Um, this group mutated two amino acid residues of a plasmid-borne tryptophan gene of E. coli, transfected a tryptophan minus bacterial, which means it couldn't grow its own, make its own tryptophan, uh, with the plasmid, and then grew it in a tryptophan-limiting medi medium. So basically, they, they took out, they mutated a tryptophan gene, producing gene twice. And then they put it back into the organism um, as a plasmid, but, but basically the organism now had a mutated tryptophan gene, and if it could just mutate it back, it could use tryptophan. And they grew it in tryptophan limiting medium, which means that if you did grow, to, if you were able to produce tryptophan, you had a huge advantage in that medium. One of the mutations alone completely inactivates the gene product. The other mutation, when present alone, allows weak tryptophan activity and supports the growth in tryptophan uh, negative media when the plasmid-borne gene is overexpressed. So if you could fix the, the first one, then you could uh, make a little bit of tryptophan, and that would be an, a slight advantage. And then if you fix the second one, you would be back to normal. The authors expected cells containing the double mutant plasmid to take a short selected route to full tryptophan positive activity when grown in tryptophan limiting medium by first reversing the inactivating mutation at position 49, allowing weak tryptophan activity, and then reverting the second mutation at position 60 to gain full activity. However, almost all mutants recovered after sustained growth had not taken even the first step of that expected pathway. Rather, the expression of the tryptophan A gene was decreased, either by deletion, insertion of an IS element, or by various point mutations, apparently saving the cell the energy of overproducing the protein. So basically, it, the protein didn't work, so they just disabled it. So to basically, you have a car with a spare tire, so to speak, and uh, it isn't functional, so what you do is you ditch the spare tire. You can drive faster and with better mileage that way. The E. coli point mutation rate is 5 times 10 to the minus 10th. Gager et al., 23, grew liquid cultures to an effective population size any of around six uh, times 10 to the seventh cells per generation. So, uh, that'd be about six billion, pardon me, six million. Uh, substituting these numbers into equation two shows that um, Rd over Fx would be 5.3, greater than one, if Rs were one and Rv were 100. That is, if the selective advantage of the cell received from shutting down overexpression of the plasmid-borne gene were equal to the selective advantage it would receive from taking the first gain of function mutational step to partial tryptophan plus activity, the loss of function mutation would be expected to be easily fixed in the population well before a gain of function mutation occurred, which is in fact what happened. For one partial relevant 
par partial revertin to be expected to occur before the loss of function mutation, uh, mutant fixed under the conditions of the experiment, RS would have to be 0 0.2. That is, the selection coefficient for the gain of function mutation would have to be approximately five-fold greater than that of the loss of function mutation. Equations four and five can be used to show that for the gain of function mutant to be expected to be dominate the population to around 90%, the gain of function selection coefficient would have to be 12.5 times that of the loss of function mutation. Apparently, regaining merely limited tryptophan activity did not have the 12.5 times the selective value of the decrease in expression of the plasma gene caused by the loss of function mutation. Just not enough advantage to having a weak tryptophan producing activity. Thus, under the conditions of the experiment, the selective pathway back to full tryptophan activity is blocked at the first step. Interestingly, if cells transfected with either, but not both, of those uh, mutations were grown in liquid culture, tryptophan positive revertins quickly took over the culture. In other words, we can do single mutations Double mutations, not so much. Indicating that selection coefficients for full reversion was greater than 12.5 times the selection coefficient for saving the cell of energy of overproducing the protein. So if you, know, you get flat tires enough, why you keep the flat tire even though, uh, and, and you figure out how to repair it so that it can be actually used. A comparison to short-term evolution in the wild. A possible objection to results from laboratory evolution experiments is that they're artificial. The organisms are housed in special environments and not exposed to the rigor and variety of challenges they would recover in nature. Thus, the many advantages loss of function mutations have served in the experimental work may not reflect what happens in nature, since presumably the great majority of an organism's genes are, not re uh, pardon me, are required in the wild, and therefore, few, if any, adaptive loss of function mutations are available in nature. While that may turn out to be the case, and more data will be required to come up with a definitive conclusion, an increasing number of results from nature appear to ratify the importance of the adaptive loss of function mutations in the wild. One class of such loss of function mutations, which I've mentioned previously, includes genes that helped adapt humans to the presence of malaria. Other important human adaptive mutations are also loss of function mutations. For example, immunity to HIV due to deletion variant of CCR5 and resistance of tuber to tuberculosis by deletion variant of SLC11A1. So there are loss of function mutations, but gain of function mutations are rare. And the ones that are there are Mm, well, they have their own problems, like sickle cell. Development of lactose tolerance in adult humans also appears to be a good ca a candidate for ad an adaptive loss of function mutation, perhaps by loss of a rep repressor binding site, although that has not yet been confirmed. That's just theoretical at this point. In a recent survey of multiple human genomes, it has been determined that for humans, on average, each person is found to carry 250 to 300 loss of function variants in annotated genes. That means genes we know what they're supposed to be doing. Over 1% of the total number of human genes. A second example of loss of function mutation in nature is seen in the evolution of plague bacterium, Yersinia pestis. Plausible evolutionary scenario to explain its great virulence, and this would be true even if one is a creationist, by the way, um, is that it serially acquired several plasmids which conferred on it the ability to be transferred between mammalian hosts by flea bite. Going from rats to humans and back to rats and to other rats and to other humans. After the acquisition of these plasmids, which are gain-of-function events, because the bacteria didn't have that information before, the Y. pestis genome lost several hundred genes, apparently because they were no longer necessary for its new life cycle. Thus, after several gain-of-function events, which were almost like planned or something, 
The plague bacterium adjusted to its new environment by much more numerous and rapid loss of function adaptive mutations in the wild. Nadeau and Jiggins have recently reviewed genomic studies of adaptation in natural populations and note that many of the well-studied examples of adaptive evolution have involved trait loss, such as the loss of bony structure in fre freshwater stickleback populations and the reduction of pigmentation in eyes in cavefish. Although, as mentioned earlier in this chapter, there is not a necessary correlation between phenotypic trait loss and adaptive loss of function mutations, in the cases mentioned by Nadeau and J Jiggins, they coincide. Loss of pelvic spines in freshwater sticklebacks has been traced to a deletion of a pit X1 enhancer. Eye reduction in cavefish apparently involves multiple genes, and not all in the same cavefish. Of those that have been identified, three involve decreased expression of the gene, uh, gamma M crystalline, rhodopsin, and alpha A crystalline. One gene, HSP90A, has increased expression, and it appears to be involved in promoting apoptosis. So it's a gain of function, but a gain of the ability to destroy the cells, which is still not quite what we had in mind when we are trying to build complex structures. Organisms have adapted over evolutionary history both in by gaining and losing functions. Therefore, it is of basic interest to determine if one or the other dominates during particular circumstances. Until the past few decades, however, the molecular events underlying these processes were obscure because we couldn't sequence the genes easily. In recent decades, science has in some cases gained the ability to determine whether the events behind a phenotypic adaptation involved an adaptive gain-of-function mutation or an adaptive loss-of-function mutation. Both experimental and laboratory work over the past few decades and recent genomic studies of adaptation in natural populations attest to the importance, even dominance, of loss-of-function mutations in short-term evolutionary episodes. The work presented in this paper helps show why this should be the case. Functional genetic elements such as genes and regulatory regions are built of multiple nucleotides and a substantial fraction of mutations to these elements will cause them to lose their function. Thus, the loss of function mutation rate can be orders of magnitude greater than the nucleotide substitution rate. On the other hand, gain of function mutation rates tend to be quite specific. And what happens if you have to have two precise mutations? Now it's even lower, or five, or seven. So the rate of, for ad adaptive gain-of-function mutations tends to be equal or very similar to the nucleotide mutation rate, or is, as I pointed out, if you have multiple, it may be e much less. As shown here, for some population size regions and for some values of the ratio of selection coefficients, the greater rate of mutation to the adaptive state for loss of function versus gain of function gives adaptive loss of function mutations an intrinsic edge over g adaptive gain of function mutations. In retrospect, the result is straightforward. Yet, it also seems somewhat surprising because, as Nato and Jiggins write, watch why it's surprising from a perspective. There clearly are complex structures that are gained during evolution. We know that because evolution happened, right? And we currently know little about how this process takes place. Think about that. It may be hoped that understanding how organisms survive in the short term by adaptive loss of function mutations will be a step towards understanding how complex structures are built over the long term. Um, maybe it took um, a targeted change. Now, my take on this is that I think Behe has demonstrated that beneficial loss of function mutations in general should be far more common than gain-of-function mutations. Both are selected, which means that uh, there's not a difference between the two in that regard. That means that in general, evolution actually means devolution, loss of function, loss of information. It is not clear how such a process could build complex structures, at least, could do that, uh, could do so without guidance. But 
That's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Any comments? Ar Ar Ariel, you want to? Uh, how does this compare with uh, Sanford's uh, figures uh, and suggestions that uh, a ratio of good to bad mutations, one, one to a thousand sometimes even, or uh, put this report together with with what Sanford uh, talks about rates of mutation of bad mutations well one of the things that I think is worth pointing out is that a loss of function mutation is a mutation that appears to give an organism an advantage and therefore appears to be evolutionary advancement but what's actually happening at the genome level is that you are losing a structure or losing a function. And um, in order to get from bacteria to, let's say, birds, you're going to have to get creatures that develop feathers and wings and uh, respiratory systems at all, and then respiratory systems that are highly efficient for extracting oxygen out of air at 35,000 feet, which most of us, if we were put at 35,000 feet, we would pass out and probably die. So we're trying to create very precise structures. Now, in Darwin's day, they didn't understand how that worked. And so he just kind of said, well, you get a little better here and a little better here and a little better here. But that doesn't tell you what kinds of proteins it takes, what kinds of amino acids it takes, what kinds of genetic codes it takes to make those amino acids, and how you're going to get there by single little steps. What we're finding out is that the steps are far more than what we expected. And it's a little bit like expecting computer code to do a function to just kind of pop out of thin air. Um, you know, if you change one letter and then you can get something to run together and, and, and make a better code in some particular circumstance, then you're doing okay. But most of the time, what you need is 50 or 100 lines of code. Well, you know, you can't just mutate those into existence where every step is beneficial. And what this is saying is that, that evolution in general will select for loss of function before it selects for gain of function to try to get an advantage. And you're going, well, how does that work? Well, very simply, uh, if you have uh, birds that somehow make it over to an island, and it's way in the middle of the ocean and there's, there's very little land elsewhere. They managed to get there because of, a, say, a storm or they landed on some kind of uh, debris that floated over. If those birds have the ability to fly, sometime they're going to wind up flying up high enough to get caught by the wind and blown away from the island. And if there's no other islands for hundreds of miles around, then if they can't make it back to the island, they die. If they're on the island and they can't fly, they're not going to get blown away by the next storm. So it's actually an advantage to be flightless in that situation. So if you have a mutation that takes out the wings, then you sit there on the ground and you never get blown out to sea. And that's how we get the dodo, which is adapted to the island on which it is. It doesn't fly, so it doesn't get blown out to sea. And it's evolved to be big. 
It would be very interesting. We do still have some dodo material around. Uh, it would be interesting. It's a pigeon is what it is, just a giant flightless pigeon. Um, it would be very interesting to take that and, and analyze what the DNA of it was and whether it got any advantages, uh, whether it got any new material that allowed it to be where it was, or whether all of the, the changes were degenerative. If I had my personal bet, I'd say probably they're all going to be degenerative. Um, and so what you see is evolution that looks like it's adapting things to the environment, when what it's really doing is it's destroying stuff that you don't need anymore. And then, in fact, in the new circumstances might actually be uh, disadvantageous. If there's a whole bunch of small holes somewhere, then you evolve to be able to run through those holes so that, you know, you get weasels that can follow the mice into the holes. Or you get badgers who are able to dig the holes. But the weasels are not getting, well, they're certainly not getting bigger. They're getting smaller. And they're getting smaller forefeet. And in fact, uh, dachshunds, uh, badger hounds in, in German, are, are actually uh, achondroplastic dwarfs. You can point to a specific mutation that also occurs in humans um, that causes their cartilage not to form properly. And so they get little bitty legs and they maintain their jaw size. Um, and they're just perfect to go after badgers because they're in a hole. Uh, their temperament also is not to back down. And they are extremely fast with their mouths. Um, but it's a degenerative change. The dachshund did not evolve something new. It actually lost something <coughs> in terms of information. Uh, if you think about it, this is basically like taking, a, say, some kind of a Windows program and disabling a particular function. Well, if you don't need that function, that's wonderful in terms of what you're using because you no longer have to worry about wandering into that area and getting mixed up. But if you're, uh, if you're trying to create a new function, that's no way to make one. The way to make one is to get a programmer in and put in the code that needs to be there. And that's the, that's the real problem is that there is, in the standard model there's no programmer. And yet you really need one to get the new functions. And part of the reason you need one is because the, the loss of functions happen faster even though what you need to get from bacteria to humans is a whole bunch of gain of function. Isn't be he being a little bit generous to evolution? Yes, he is. Because we haven't counted all of the loss of function mutations that are detrimental, but are not detrimental enough to kill the organism. And so they're not being effectively screened out. But the, the real question is, uh, how do you build an eye when you don't have an eye? Uh, That's right. Uh, you need crystalline genes. See, this is the thing, you know, it was just, well, this stuff kind of comes together. Well, it doesn't just kind of come together. You need specific plans for it. And the plans come from somebody who planned because, you know, you, <laughs> Programming a computer is not turning on the machine and, uh, and hoping that uh, the random noise will, will work with your program. Uh, so Sanford's figures are probably closer to reality than... than That's right. Than be, he is, be he is actually being generous. What, what we're showing is that there, are, there is more than one problem involved. There's Behe's problem and then there's Sanford's problem behind it. Uh, we, okay, comment here and then up there. Go ahead. So how do we fit the obviously losing function and the 
devolution to our understanding of creation. So basically we're saying God created all this stuff at the beginning, and then because of sin, then everything is losing and, and going downhill. But if it's actually gaining some temporary sort of function that, even though it's a loss of function, it's, it's an adaption that helps the organism at whatever location that it's adapted to, how does that fit? Um, well, the creation is groaning. Thank you. It's losing function anyway from the uh, processes that, um, what's his name, uh, Sanford pointed out. And, and a lot of the time when it does gain function, it's actually gaining it by destroying the underlying information, which is what Behe is pointing out. And, and so if, if you start out with a, a well-designed machine, then for certain circumstances, you can, uh, uh, you can actually trash some of the stuff. You know, if you want to go light, you can take the radio out. It doesn't really matter. On the other hand, if you're in traffic, the radio is really nice to know where the, uh, where the, where the accident is so that you can go around it to the, and get on at the next intersection afterwards. Yeah, so it sounds like we're asking the demolition contractor to do the construction, huh? Basically, that's right. And the, the, the thing of it is, it, it won't work. Okay. Uh, I'm going to pass it back there. Uh, and then uh, after, after him, then you, you. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, you've been saying essentially what I was going to say. Uh, even with the gain of function, you're using some of the original uh, organism. And at the time, this has got to add up where you're getting away from what uh, God designed and created and, and its total function is probably going to go extinct if you just did that. I don't know what time. You know, it yeah. looks like we're getting something temporarily. On the run, I think we're losing. Yeah. Well, Behe is just another variation of the point that, you know, if you see, if you see the river coming down at you and there's a swimmer who's swimming five miles an hour against the current, and the current is 30 miles an hour, there are two things you know. Number one, eventually he's going to go over the waterfall on the other side. Just divide it a little bit. And number two, he didn't get there by swimming upstream. It's like uh, we're saying everything's still obeying the laws of thermodynamics. You can't win, you'll always lose, and you can't get out of the game. Everything is heading towards a decay, according to even, even Psalms 102. And thou shalt wax old like a garment. Everything is going to go away eventually, and God is going to create something new. That's right. We are doing the same thing right now. We are devolving from what a previous high state of grace that uh -huh. we were before. We wanted to see what life was like without God's direct intervention. We're getting to see it. And, and we it's know it's not a fool's good. game what they're proclaiming that it came yeah. on its own. With the one exception that actually you can get out of the game. In fact, everybody does eventually. Because you die. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting observation. I notice the uh, questions and comments are moving in the direction of theology and I'm always does my heart good when we start uh, moving in the direction of implications, and there are big implications for theology, as everyone knows, and that's why we like this class. Um, I'm, I'm going to start with genetics, but since I know very little about genetics, I'll jump immediately into theology. You know, to get enough generations to do the statistics that Behe and some of these others are doing, You've got to work with bacteria or something that has a very uh, fast turnover time. Otherwise, your grant money runs out a long time before you <laughs> get that. Your <laughs> grant money and your patience. If, if, we, if we try to do anything with higher organisms with genetics, forget it. So we're extrapolating all the time. But the point I would like to make is that God, being creator of all, he knows the past, the present, and the future. He can, 
he can do better than Einstein. We're doing a lot of uh, tributes now lately to Einstein because this year is the anniversary of one of his big major, um, you know, writings and theories came out. In 1950, was that general relativity? Yeah, there was. I think 1905 was special relativity. One was special. 1915 is general. Yeah. So there's, I see a lot in the uh, news magazines and stuff uh, about Einstein. But uh, he did thought experiments, but you could say God could also do that in that he knows the past, the present, and the future. So he could take genetics of any organism and work it all out to almost an infinite number of generations, and he would know the end result, mm -hmm. which would be a tremendous advantage. But uh, I think we're definitely like Einstein, we feel like we're, we're in the presence of God when we, when we do this and when we extrapolate. And it also is a humbling experience, how little we know. You know, extrapolating from bacteria to you and I, wow, that's a big jump. <laughs> comment there and then comment there. Go ahead. Um. Me? Um, beginning of the class, you mentioned uh, suggestions for to get into next. I felt uh, perhaps from time to time it would be a bad idea to um, give a summary of what we have covered so far uh, in a more of a layman's term. Sometimes some of these fly over my head. It may not fly over other folks, but it do mine. Um, I understand the beautiful story is told, maybe it's true. He um, was a dyslexic and he could not drive. So his driver used to take him places and you'd speak. And uh, one day the driver says, hey, hey um, prof, I can do this. He says, sure, you go make the presentation. So he went up there and made a flawless presentation. And uh, someone, of course, and he's sitting at the back, someone uh, in the audience asked him a question. And he, he says, this thing is so simple, even my driver can answer you. So, of course, Einstein gave the answer. So, um, I <laughs> 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 um, what I'm saying is that uh, this would be great, you know, for us to get a summary from time to time. And then in our own lives, we could use this and, uh, as we share uh, the thoughts on uh, uh, faith and uh, belief yeah. in a creator. Well, if it helps you any, um, I've actually been asked to give a summary of, uh, or at least a... a a review of of this book for Origins, and so probably in the next couple of weeks or so, I'll, I'm going to try to get one in, um, which means it'll be before I actually get a uh, 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 before I finish uh, the whole series. But uh, let's do it for other presentations too. I think very recently Ariel had uh, an article in the review in the Science of the Times. You made nine point about. Uh, yeah, there was an article. <coughs> uh, this was in the science. Yeah. Yes. Well, there is a place for bird's eye view uh, 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 summaries, and um, uh, perhaps um, we'll every once in a while do more of that to to give you a picture of where all the little pieces go. But I think it's also important for us every, uh, f and, it's, and it's something that you can't get from a lot of other places, to go down deep into the data and take a look at it and, and, and see where we actually contact reality. So um, it's important to do both kinds. Uh, right now I'm doing the, kind of the, the, the non-reality, you know, the, the, the the deeper stuff, and then we'll, and maybe we'll come up and, and do some summaries later on. Uh, question here, and then over there. What would be the main counter argument by a um, geneticist um, to uh, what we've heard here this morning by a Darwinian geneticist? I think most of what you would see would be picking around the edges and 
and in, in, in a particular case, because we've seen where he made the same argument in a specific case in clerical and resistance. And they tried to prove that he was wrong because there were more ex uh, mutations than he expected or because there were less mutations than he expected. Turns out he was right. His critics were wrong. But they didn't want to admit that because, the, because what you do when you don't actually have the arguments on your side is instead of making the arguments, you try to destroy the reputation of the person who's arguing for the other side. And that's what, they, that's what has been traditionally done for him. Uh, it's very interesting to watch from the sidelines. They don't really have a good argument. I mean, they can make a case that, for example, uh, maybe in one situation he should have, uh, you know, 10 instead of 5 as a number. That doesn't destroy what's being done. And it, it's... In, in, I mean, it's in some cases totally irrelevant. We saw this happen with uh, Durrett and Schmidt who were trying to discredit Behe by saying he was off by a, tact a factor of 10 to the 5. And instead of hundreds of millions of years for, um, for humans to change two, non, uh, two mutations, one, one, the first of which was non-helpful and the second of which was helpful, that it was only a hundred and uh, it was only a um, hundred and sixty million. You know, it doesn't really matter. So nowadays, if we're going to make that argument, we just quote Dirt and Schmidt, and they don't have any They don't have any answer for that because Dirt and Schmidt is their their guys admitting it. Nowadays, if I want to make a comment about the RNA world, I just pull out Eugene Kunin. He makes the point. Whenever they sit down and do the actual calculations, their, their calculations come out somewhere within reasonable orders of magnitude of what ours would. And they're doing with all kinds of favorable assumptions. So it doesn't matter. They don't have an answer. And the only answer they do have is to try to discredit the person who's making the point. I hate to put it that way, but that's the way it is. I saw a summary of that book by Sanford online that I haven't gotten and tried to read yet, so that might be of interest to some. It looked like they, that he tried to, to uh, summarize the book a little. They actually have it in print here by Sanford. Um, uh, for a while, um, what's his name? Uh, Bernard Brandstater had several copies of it and was distributing them around, but uh, I don't know what's happened at that point. It, it, it's not it's not a great summary, I might state. Uh, when you read uh, the, the conclusions are so brief, you, you hardly know where he's going. Uh, I'm thinking of that. that uh, We're probably doing a better job in this Sabbath school than the book is. But it will, if you read it ahead of time, you at least maybe have some orientation to where we're going, so that you uh, so that you get an idea of what some of the issues are involved. I do wish Stanford had evaluated a little more, or sometimes his, his conclusion is so brief, I hardly know what he's talking about. You know, I'm, I'm thinking now about trying to summarize the book in, you know, however many... Uh, yeah, good uh, luck. Two pages, <laughs> three pages of, of the book, is, it's going to be tough. So is there any fallout in the scientific community with with this kind of thing coming out. It seems like I was walking through the magazine stand, National Geographic had a had a, a magazine uh, talking about ID, you know, and and just just it seemed like the the titles were going ballistic that they were creating straw straw men and 
to create, to <laughs> blow them up and, and that kind of thing. So is there anything really happening as far as in the scientific community about this, um, the probability of life yeah. being um, evolving from nothing, from, from spontaneous generation? Well, there are two things that are happening. Okay, one of them is, as you said, there's, there's increasingly shrill and contentless attacks. Or, I can see that. Yeah, and, and that noise that you're hearing is because people are very afraid. And if you don't know, if you don't know the issues, you know, it's tempting, to, it's tempting to listen to them and after all they're the scientists and so forth. But, but if you know what the issues are that they're discussing, you realize that, 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 the, that the logical points just aren't there. That's number one, and I think that it's demonstrating that our position is actually more solid than many people would like to say. And, and that what we're actually seeing is a theological resistance rather than a scientific one. That's number one. The other thing that's, that, um, that is happening is that you're seeing them increasingly concede the points that they were fighting for years and years. Eugene Koonin is now coming out and saying, look, we just have to have multiple universes. Because un unless you do that, the odds are just so incredibly low that it ain't going to happen. More than we would like to admit, we believe what we want to believe. And uh, we need to keep this in mind. And furthermore, there is a very important study we ought to uh, get into, and that is the sociology of the scientific community. You know, it's a strange thing that uh, when plate tectonics showed up, uh, the it's whole, the it's whole first ignored and then it's ridiculed, and then all of a sudden, sudden the whole boom. community adopts it. Uh, Science is a sociological phenomenon as well as a, an objective evaluation of nature. If it wasn't for that, you'd expect to see more and more people gradually accepting it and you know, it wouldn't be a big deal. But it is a big deal. And, the, and the, the arguments that are being used, the vociferousness of them combined with their lack of content or their deliberately twisting of what ID says uh, tells you that, that, that there's more to this than just a scientific dispute. Uh, also, uh, addressing the gentleman's uh, point, there are a lot of scientists that do agree with creation. In fact, there's a book called In Six Days. There is also has a lot of essays with secular scientists are actually coming to the belief that creation did happen. Even Richard Dawkins, their current high priest of, uh, <clears throat> of uh, evolution, he's basically admitted that I don't know what really is going on. There is something else that is happening. And he's basically saying or tacitly admitting without admitting anything that there is something else that is responsible for us and everything else and the universe. He's going to lose money doing that, though. <laughs> it is also a question of economics. You won't get a grant if you don't support evolution. You won't be able to teach. You won't be able to do anything unless you get money for it. I so said, what's to say that the love of money is the root of all evil? This yeah. is pretty much the same thing. It's a shell game. Well, money and influence. Yeah, it's. Not all, money is a root of all evils, it's not the root of all evils, uh, a root of all kinds of evil, but, uh, but it's certainly, uh, certainly there's a convergence between money and position and power. It, you know, how, do you, how do you maintain your position? Well, you maintain your position by publishing or perishing. And how do you get to be published? Well, you publish the things that they want. And, uh, and you also get m enough money to do the work to get published. And uh, so, you know, if you don't get grants, you don't get, you don't do studies, you can't publish them, and you're out of a job. 
And the only, the only way around that is to get tenure and then, and then do it, which is kind of partly how Behe gets it. Of course, Behe still publishes, as witness this. Be he has tenure. And there's one other thing that's uh, very interesting. I don't know if you were looking at that, but there was that one combination study, which is a fascinating study. Who is it done by? Gager and, uh, and, the, and the group that the Discovery Institute is funding. That's one other way around the publish or perish thing is you get your funding from somebody who's ID friendly. And they published something that's really worthwhile. The study was impressive. It was done in a way that, uh, that actually proves a point. Of course, it's not the point that most people in the science business would like to see proved, but you know, it's, it's a worthwhile. So if you ever hear people saying, well, why doesn't I do, do, do more research? Well, there's two reasons. Number one is, that they don't have as much funding. But the number two thing is they do more research. We are now starting to see that laboratory publish periodically some really good work in terms of, you know, they take theories and they test them. Um, of course, the results aren't exactly what the majority of the scientific community wants, but you know, that's okay. Do you have a You know, that's an interesting question. I don't, but I think there is one available on the internet, and it's probably updated periodically. A printed bibliography of the of ID research. I have seen one. I don't know how complete it is, um, but. Um, you know, now that I know that this study is out there, which I don't read biocomplexity on a routine basis, maybe that's one thing we should do and start bringing some of that research here. Um, yes. You know, I was wondering if if there's coming a time when pure materialism is going to snap, and maybe some sort of spiritualistic um, counterfeit will come in, and um, and create a <coughs> create an explanation other mm -hmm. than what you get out of the Bible. I, you know, it sounds like, you know, the rubber bands twisting that that might happen pretty shortly. Yeah, uh, I, think, I think if the atheist rubber band snaps, it will not mean the end of all opposition to uh, the religion of Christ. No. That you will, in fact, see perversions of that religion step to the front as well. I think, I think the issue will change then from is there a God, is there not a God, to is the Bible true or isn't it? Uh, you'll have progressive creation in there, you'll have theistic evolution in there, and all kinds of things competing with the uh, plain reading of the Bible. Or maybe something completely new that's... Yeah, you could... Well, it'll probably have it, new... It doesn't take long to, to, to produce new ideas, you know. It'll, it'll probably have some new and some old uh, in, in an odd well, mixture. A mixture. <laughs> uh, <laughs> in fact, it reminds one of the, uh, of the uh, Scarlet... The, the, the uh, lady writing on the beast that uh, has mixed stuff in her cup. Yeah. Well, all kinds of stuff in there. Uh, and, and, and some of it not compatible with itself. I am amazed to read of the Thomists that ignore St. Thomas Aquinas' clear belief in a creation week. How you can be a Thomist and not believe what St. Thomas Aquinas believed is not totally clear, but they do. So uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff coming up on that. Well, I should probably close now, but uh, uh, 
uh, come on back next week and we'll uh, look at one of the other chapters here. And uh, hopefully it will be as interesting and informative as the one we had this week.